Hello again, and welcome back to another week of Daily Bible Studies. We're continuing on with the Gospel according to Luke today, and actually all this week we're going to be looking at uh, God, the chapter 5 of Luke. Before we start, let's pray. Uh, loving God, we know that you use different things to get our attention. Lord, help us to see where you are at work. Help us to notice when you move so that we can continue to look for you. And Lord, guide our steps as we reply and as we respond in faith. Lord, we ask you to watch over us at this time, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we were talking about uh, last week some of these kind of early moments in, the, in Luke's account of the early ministry of Jesus. And now we have this first account here of Jesus calling disciples in Luke. And so this is chapter 5, starting in verse 1, where we write, Now it happened that while the crowd was passing around, pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put, into, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of the fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats back to land, uh, they left everything and followed him. Um, so, of course, there's always so many ways you can look at these things, which is why these are, these are reflections and not necessarily exhaustive uh, commentaries and, and uh, explorations of the scripture. Um, but I think the thing I want to draw attention to is we looked at John at one point before, and we had this moment where Jesus does a miracle at the end of John that looks very much like this. And it's almost certainly um, you know, me meant to call back to mind this miracle that was done. But the fascinating part is, so, so um, you know, Jesus gives this miracle and gives them a fabulous catch of fish um, that probably was worth many days' work. And instead of resting in that, instead of you know, enjoying that and all the rest, they eventually leave it behind and go follow Jesus. Now, maybe they sold out. We don't know. But the fact of the matter is they did not remain. They had the best fishing day of their life, and they did not choose to remain as fishermen, but to go and follow Jesus where he leads. And I think it's just fascinating. Uh, and I think what it has to do with the fact of the matter is um, we talk about the miracles in the Bible. And, 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 I, and nothing I'm about to say is meant in any way to downplay the miraculous, but simply to let us see miracles from another angle. Because um, you know, there's, been a, there's been a traditional understanding of, of what a miracle is since the, the, what they call the Enlightenment and, the, and modern you know, science all the rest. And the idea is that a miracle is something that breaks the laws of nature. It's a violation of the law of nature. And the fact of the matter is, if that's our definition of what a miracle is, then there are so often no, then there would be almost no miracles in the Bible. Not, not absolutely none, but you would have very few of them. Because look at this miracle. Here's a miracle. They go out, experience fishermen. They go out, they, they, they fish all day. They don't catch anything. And then Jesus comes out, and, uh, and all of a sudden, they're catching a huge amount of fish. You know, John's account of the similar miracle is even more dramatic, where it's they had their, boat, their net on one side of the boat. Jesus says, put it on the other side of the boat. You know, there's no, there's no reason from a, from a fishing perspective why that should make such a difference. And yet, there's this miraculous catch of fish. And, and yet, there is no law of nature being broken. You know, the laws of physics have not stopped. You know, uh, even the laws of entropy and fluid dynamics haven't changed. Uh, it is one of those things where the miracle is more than just necessarily what specifically happens. It's also about when it happens and how it happens. You know, it's one of those things where I remember reading, you know, hearing about that, that the, the parting of the Red Sea is not an absolutely unique phenomenon in history, that there are strong winds that really can produce something very much like what we read about in the parting of the Red Sea, and to, which has led some people to say, look, it wasn't a miracle. You know, it really wasn't a miracle. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if something that can happen but almost never does, but it happens right in a moment where it means life or death, not just for you but for your whole nation, uh, that, I think, meets the biblical definition of miraculous. And so the same way, you know, um, you know, Jesus could have found some way to bring these fish here, it doesn't make it less miraculous. All it's saying is that it doesn't need to violate the laws of nature to be genuinely a miracle of God. And I think that that is important to notice because um, conceivably, 
Simon and his compatriots could very well have, on a different day, have had just a truly fantastic day of fishing where they happened to put their nets down in the right time, in the right place, uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be a miracle. The miracle here is not just that they have a fabulous catch of fish, is that they had it after having zero success at all. It happens right when this stranger comes along and does it. And if this was the only miracle of Jesus, then maybe you could even write it off as a massive, those significant coincidence. But it's not though. We see it happen with Jesus all the time, all the time. And even Peter at the time is able to recognize something unusual is happening. It's not just a really great day of fishing. It's happened with all these other contexts around it and it points to the fact that this man who called them out into the ocean uh, has really done something remarkable and dramatic. And it makes you think about, I, I had, um, you know, there's a clergy, um, um, there's a, a pastor that I knew, uh, he has since passed away, but he, I remember him talking at a, at a Christmas weekend I was part of, and he had been a biology student, and he had, you know, told us about being fascinated by the story of the burning bush, and how it caught Moses' attention, and he, remember, he shared with us, he kept saying, God, show me, give me, give me my own burning bush, I don't need a big burning bush, I need, you know, just, just, just a little burning bush would be fine. And he talked about how, as a biology student in college, you know, he became just fascinated by uh, the, the, the level of design and the level of, of sheer incredible engineering that was going on in, in a plant slide that he was observing. And he couldn't help but say, that especially because the dye that was being used, it almost looked like it was you know, on fire. And so he couldn't help but say, this is, this is God using this small burning bush to get my attention. So I wonder, you know, what in your life has been the miraculous thing that God has done to get your attention? You know, and it's okay if when you think about it, you say, well, it doesn't feel very miraculous when we say it out loud. The fact, that, the fact that God used it to get your attention made it a miracle, even if the outside observer says, well, it could have been anything. Well, it could have, but it happened at that time, at that place, to you, and it didn't just happen. It happened so you notice it, and it happened so you drew your attention back to God. So when have those things happened in your life, when God has managed to use even the simple little things and use them not as just simple little things, but as signposts to direct you back to him? Well, that's all I have for today. Come back in tomorrow. We'll continue on with Matt, or with Luke, sorry, chapter uh, five. Have a good day.